those hooks, huh? I just texted one of my old coworkers about the hooks, and he said, I just did a week-long refactor that it would have helped with, but oh well. So that's my only criticism. Should have done it earlier. Um, all right, so today I'm going to talk about doing all of your React development in the cloud, which I did with this simple to-do game, so that you can screw around on your project from anywhere. A little bit about me. I started out in biotech for three years until the industry crashed. I lost my job. I went to an animation boot camp. I did animation for 10 years, working on such movies as How to Train Your Dragon 2. And then the industry crashed, and I lost my job again. And I went to a coding boot camp. I was a front-end dev at Pepper Data, a small startup for two years. And now I am a front-end dev at Google, where I have been for six months. So me and React. You might wonder, do you use React at Google? I don't. Uh, some people do. It's uh, got some small usage at Google, but my team doesn't. I did use React before I came to Google for the past two years, and I still screw around on React in my spare time because it's a lot of fun. I love React. Uh, some of that I have done on this very Chromebook that I am demoing with. So a Chromebook is not known for being a good dev computer. So how did I do it? So I'm going to show you a little game that I made and then how I made it. OK, so the demo that I'm going to show you is called To Do the Game. And the inspiration is that every time someone wants to show off a new framework or technology, it seems like they do a to-do app. So it's become a cliche. Uh, it's understandable why, because they're really easy to make and easy for people to understand, but they're a little boring by now. Uh, games are a fun demo that people like to see. But they're hard to make, because you've got to do the graphics, and you've got to do the decision making and interaction. So what if we could combine the two? What if we could make a demo that was both boring and hard to make, <laughs> like a financial spreadsheet? <laughs> so that's what, no. Uh, so we're going to want to make something that is easy to make and fun. What if we could make something that has the simple interaction of a to-do app, but it's a game somehow? How could you make a to-do app into a game, though? without adding too much, because the only interaction a player has is to be able to check off items. So that's not much choice. But if you get philosophical about it, inaction is in itself a choice. So not checking off a box is also a choice. So what does this mean? Let's see it in action. All right, here's the demo. So I have picked the default game, set the speed to faster. If I hit start, OK, so a couple of things I can text my significant other about their job interview, and fill out a job application for Walmart, because it sounds like a really exciting job. Um, and if I don't turn in the job application, I won't get the job. And I should also read that book. You know, significant others always want you to read something. Oh, I didn't water my plant. Now it's dead. Um, but I've got more things to take care of, because I've got to call that Walmart person back, because I really want that job. And I didn't like the book, so I really need to let Kay know what I thought. And, oh no, uh, uh, but I, I don't have any nice clothes for the interview, so I got to borrow a nice outfit for the interview. And Kay's pretty mad I didn't like the book, so I got to filter those emails. And, you know, where are all these maggots coming from in my apartment? Okay, so. That's like a simple, fun, that's as far as the game goes. That's a simple, fun, kind of silly game you can make. You can also go in a different direction with this medium and make a very heavy message kind of game. So we're loading it up. It's still set to faster. OK, so should I speak out for the communists? No, I don't identify as a communist. Oops. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right, let's hope that's my only oopsie for the presentation. OK, no, I'm not going to speak out for the communists, because I'm not a communist. Um, should I speak out for the Social Democrats? No, I don't, I don't know who they are. None of my business. Should I speak out for the trade unionists? They seem like troublemakers. I don't want to get involved. Speak out for the Jews. I'm not Jewish. I don't think it affects me. All right, so. <laughs> OK, so that's like a really serious usage of this app. It's based on that famous speech by Martin Niemöller about how he didn't do enough to stop the Holocaust. So you can use this app to convey that kind of message, uh, really taking inaction being a choice to an extreme. Uh, OK, so the uh, previous game, 
you saw, it had a lot of branching in it, and you can imagine how annoying it would be to create a level like that with some kind of linear interface, just like in a JSON file or a database, deal with all the possible branching choices. So yeah, it is pretty annoying. So I built myself an admin panel, and uh, I gated it off with a login, because I don't want you editing my game. Only I, the game dev, should be able to edit the game. So here's the admin panel. The UI really sucks because it's only for me. And here's the three original tasks. And you can see the tasks that will spawn if you complete it. Or if you don't complete it after a certain amount of time, you can follow the trail. And you can edit, add more spawn tasks. And it's all gated behind this auth thing. So. All right, that app was built entirely in the cloud on this Chromebook. So what part of the development flow, what's installed on this laptop? Just the browser. So what's not installed on this laptop is there's no IDE, there's no text editor, the code files aren't on this hard drive, I didn't install any of the NPM packages or CLI tools onto this computer, database server is not running on this laptop, even the dev server, the local host, not running on this Laptop. So who is doing all of that for me? So for the IDE, it's being done in AWS Cloud9, online IDE. Why am I not using a Google product? We have a wonderful product at Google, but it's only available internally. So in order to do, screw around on my personal projects, got to use something else. Uh, Code Anywhere is an alternative that is free, unlike Cloud9. Uh, Cloud9 is not very expensive, though and it, I feel like it has a better interface. Uh, Glitch is also an interesting alternative. For version control, I use GitHub, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, there's also GitLab and Bitbucket and other options. For the back end, I'll be using Firebase. I don't know about any alternatives to Firebase. I haven't done the research because I just like Firebase so much. A disclaimer, Firebase is owned by Google, but I was a big fan of Firebase before I came to Google, I promise. Um, Scout's honor. And for auth, also going to be using Firebase, which is starting to look suspicious, but it's just I don't want to create too many logins. Uh, alternatives I've heard good things about are Auth0 and Okta, which my brother works for, so shout out. Um, for deployment, I found hands down the easiest, lowest number of steps to deployment is now.sh by Zeit. Uh, another really cool deployment tool is Netlify, which I used for the demo that you saw earlier and Surge and Heroku are also alternatives. So I'm going to pause for a second and start up the Amazon Cloud9 instance, because it takes a couple minutes. So I just go to my Amazon AWS control panel, find the Cloud9 service, create an environment. All you have to do is give it a name, give it a description if you're responsible. Um, I'm going to pick small so we don't run out of memory while Yarn installing, but you can change the size of the instance later to save money. And it shuts down after 30 minutes of not being used, so you can save yourself some money. Um, OK, so let's talk a little bit about my motivation for this workflow, other than I like the Google workflow and I want to duplicate it in my personal projects. So my motivation is very bad. Basically, I'm very lazy. And I love it when other companies do all of the not, end, not front end stuff for me for free. Um, but you guys aren't going to identify with that because you are all responsible, hardworking developers who are not afraid of working up and down the stack and doing what needs to be done. So your problem might be that you have limited equipment. You might be teaching a class workshop, have a team that you're trying to keep on the same page, or you might be doing some crazy prototypes or experimenting with client side stuff. So you might be working with older machines, bad hardware. You might be mandated from above that you have to work with some OS or system that you don't like. You might have a Chromebook. And uh, I know Chrome came out with Crostini, where you can install Linux on your Chromebook now, which sounds really exciting. I don't have it. Um, and just generally, life is unpredictable. So you never know where you're going to end up and what kind of piece of crap you're going to be coding on. You could be stuck at your parents' house over the holidays. You could be stuck in another country without your computer. You could be, your MacBook keyboard could break, and then you have to take it in the shop and use a loaner. You never know. 
or you might be working on a team, you might have run into the problem where every developer kind of has their own setup and uh, because they prefer different computers, and then one person says that a deployment works on their machine, another person says they don't, they compare configs for an hour trying to figure out what went wrong. So if you have everyone log into the same environment, you don't have that problem. And for workshops and classes, similar. Everybody brings their own computer. Somebody always has problems setting up the prereqs, and all the time spent troubleshooting that could be spent teaching the class. So if you have everyone just get on their browser, log into the same environment, you can start the class. Or you might be trying some crazy new app idea or a UI experiment. You, know, you want to try out hooks or something. You're focused on the front end, and you want to do a fully functioning app with auth and data persistence, and you want to publicly deploy it so you can show it to other people without carrying your laptop around and showing them running on localhost. But you don't want to set up the back end and server because that's not what your innovation is focused on. Okay, so this workflow is not for everybody, especially if you don't have reliable internet. You can imagine how developing in the cloud could be really frustrating. So this definitely wasn't, wouldn't work for them. Uh, or if you already have a dedicated server to SSH into, or you just enjoy setting it up, or you want to have control over all parts of the pipeline, or you don't want to put your stuff on other people's servers, whether because of IP or legal reasons or privacy concerns, or you don't like the way that company treats its workers and you want to protest it, that's fine. Man needs a code. Um, or if you're picky about your text editors, there's a limited number of options in each of these text editors. Cloud9 does have Vim support if you're a Vim user. I'm not, so I don't know how good it is. Try it out. All right, and now I'm going to show you <laughs> live how to build this up. So the to-do game I demoed for you earlier, we can compare to this owl, beautiful owl, fully featured. And the app I'm going to show you how to build today is like the two circles. But since you're all such good developers, I'm sure you know how to get from the circles to the owl. And I apologize for that. All right, so let's, let's see the end product first. Okay, so. This crude facsimile is what I'm going to show you how to build. Um, so it's called the enemies list game. And you have a list of enemies. And you, when you take care of one of your enemies, you eliminate it from the list. And yeah. So I have a really boring life. So my enemies are just things that I see around my house. <laughs> all right, so yeah. And when you refresh, you get them all back because you know, you're restarting the game. So if you are an admin, you can edit the game. So I'm logging in, and now I can add enemies like other cat. <laughs> They're all bad. OK, so pretty simple, but it has auth and it has backend database persistence, which is not that simple. So. All right, this is the Amazon Cloud9 instance that I started up earlier. As you can see, we're logged into a EC2 instance of some sort, virtual machine on the cloud. And it comes pre-installed with Node, but it doesn't have the version I want because uh, it has six, which doesn't work with Create React app. This is the live coding portion. Oh my god. OK. So use 10, and then alias default 10. That means when I open up a new terminal, it'll be using 10, too. OK, so then we npm install yarn, because yarn is cool, and then npm install create react app. How many of you are familiar with create react app? Yeah, so if you're not, it's the command line tool to automatically create a React app and get started so you don't have to bother with the webpack and all. Um, and you use it by typing create React app and the name of the app you want to create. So that's just going to take a couple seconds. Here is the file system. Here is, there's panes. You can put text editor here. There's a REPL here. We can go further up the file system. And you have access to all of these bash config files, so you can set environment variables and whatever you like. And it persists between sessions. 
you can rearrange these panes, you can split them, you can move them around. Okay, so as the instructions say, CD test and yarn start. So we're starting up that React app we just created. In a few moments, it'll be up and then we can preview it. And there it is. So we have a React app up and running. Not so hard, right? So I'm going to immediately kill it and then replace it with a ringer. I have a repo where I take us from that step to the end using branches. You got to do a yarn install again. Um, so while it is installing, you can take a look. And this isn't running now. This is, this is the giant oops message you get if there's nothing running. We're going to go to app.js, and it's got everything finished already because I'm not at step zero. So step zero. OK, at step zero, we're just at the boilerplate React app. So let's start it up. And I'll prove we have nothing up our sleeve. We're just starting at the same point we were when we finished Create React App. I'm going to start up another terminal. OK, so the first thing we want to do is add the list. So in step one, we're going to start with a hard-coded list. In constructor, in state, we're setting up an enemies list that's just hard-coded to these three, setting up a remove enemy handler to remove any of these items when you click on them. And what it does is just take the string and then filter it out of the enemies list. We shrank that header down, as you can see, so we can see the list. We'll reuse it later. Um, and the list of the buttons is just a map of the enemies and creates a button, attaches remove enemy event on click. So that works. And now we want to be able to add them. So git checkout step two. OK, so creating an input ref to this new input element that we made so that React can know about it and do stuff with it. Have an add enemy handler, which just takes whatever is in the input as grabbed by the input ref and concat it onto the end of enemies. And then we clear the input here. And here's the form itself, add enemy form. It just contains the input with the reference to input ref and uh, the on click on the button calls add enemy. So we can add an enemy that I see around my house. And there we go. But if you refresh, the new thing I added is not there, because it's just saved in memory. And every time you refresh the page, it's gone. So we want to save it to the back end somewhere, up in the cloud. All right, so in order to do that, we go to Firebase. This part's a little touchy, because uh, I haven't actually created a new project every time I run through, because I have an eight project limit. So this is the first time I'm creating a project in a while. I need a project name. Um, what uh, is the most disgusting thing you can think of to put on a pizza? Cats? Gas? <laughs> we say cats or gas? OK, cats. Cats. Ca cats, gas, pizza. OK, accept the terms. You don't have to accept the Google Analytics terms, but I don't care. You don't have to put a unique name. It'll just add a bunch of numbers and letters at the end if you don't. So this takes about 15 seconds. So Firebase is a backend as a service. It provides the database, which we're using now. It also provides auth, storage, cloud functions, and even machine learning. So you see right here. Um, so first thing we want to make is the database. We want to use Firestore, the real-time database, and start in test mode so we have full access. Let's 
So the Firestore database consists of collections, that's the top level thing, and each collection contains any number of documents with a unique ID, and the documents you can think of as just basically a JSON object. So we want to create in this database a collection called enemies, and each of the documents in the collection will be one enemy with a name. And I am not used to Firestore taking this long to set up, but uh, we're going to interact with it on the client side by using a library called Firebase. So this is a library that helps on the front end that helps you interact with Firebase on the back end. OK. Let me see if it is set up yet. Yes, thank goodness. OK, Cat's gas piece is set up. Um, so up at the top, importing Firebase that I just installed, importing Firestore, removing the hard-coded list, setting enemies to empty array for now. And we have to put in a config. That's why this is having trouble. So we can do that now. Um, to get the config, you go to Project Overview. And it's got everything set up for you. It's got the API key and a bunch of other things. You normally don't want to put the API key directly into your code. But we can talk about how to really do it later. And then you take that config and initialize the Firebase app with that config, and then grab the Firestore object. Then now when you hit Add Enemy, instead of adding whatever is in this form directly, into state by concatting it onto enemies. We're going to skip all that, skip, skip state, and add it straight to Firebase by calling Firestore collection enemies, which, if you remember, we just created the database. It doesn't exist. There's no such collection. And on this non existent collection, we call add, and we're going to add a document with the name, whatever is in this form, and then clear it. And I think that's it for this step. So if I were to add cat, did it add? You don't see anything. If you go here, and refresh, we see we now have a collection called enemies. It has a single document with a generated unique ID, and it's named cat. So good, we did write. But we can't read it. So that should be our next step. OK, next step is read. So we've got to put the Firebase config back. Again, we can save all of this by using environment variables later. OK, now I'm setting up componented mount, which is obsolete now, but um, <laughs> it's this Firestore collection enemies. And uh, now, instead of calling add, as I did previously, I'm calling on snapshot, which sets an event listener every time the collection changes in the cloud. That means every time I change it, it also means every time any other user changes that collection, I get this update. It'll call this listener, which sets state, and it adds, uh, and it grabs the whole collection of enemies and maps it to a bunch of strings. So. Uh, as you've probably already seen down here, we've got cat. If I add dog, we get that too. And uh, that was really, if you saw it updated really fast, I think it does optimistic updates. So you see it even before it's actually written up to the cloud. OK, so this is a pretty cool app. There's only one problem, which is that anybody can write to this list, which if you're building a game, you don't want that. So we want to set up some auth so only certain people have permissions to add to the list. In order to do that, we go back to Firebase and go to auth. And we're going to set up a couple of sign-in methods. So email's pretty popular. People love email sign-ins. And Google's easy to set up as far as OAuth goes because it's owned by Google. You have to set up a project support email, save. 
Other um, options include Facebook, Twitter, GitHub, and Anonymous, which I don't recommend. Um, and then on the client side, so you, we need to set up a UI for login. I always hate setting those up. So they, Firebase has provided a library with all that UI, all the buttons and all. And on top of that, they provided a React wrapper around that library. So that wrapper is called React Firebase UI. So we need to install it. And step five, put in the config back. We set up in state, uh, in addition to enemies, we set up a place to store the user state, which is set to null initially. Makes sense. And then in component did mount, in addition to listening to the enemies collection, also set up an event listener on whether the auth state has changed. And whenever the auth state changes, login or logout, it gets called and it sets state to user. So that'll be null if the person is just logged out. Um, then we set up a couple of config options for the Firebase login, pretty simple. And uh, down here is just which two providers do I want to use. And here's the component itself. So let's scroll back up to the top. I imported this component called styled Firebase auth from that library I just installed. Down here is where style Firebase auth gets put. It is these two buttons. And it shows up if there's no user. If there is a user, you're going to see logout. And it's connected to Firebase auth sign out. OK, so let's try to sign in. OK, it says that this is not authorized. So you got to take whatever domain you got and whitelist it. This is for security reasons. It's actually a very good thing. Then we'll refresh. Sign in with Google. Oh, I don't know what's going on there. OK. Yeah, I don't know what happened to the list. Oh, people are adding to it. <laughs> nice. All right, so um, yeah, because the Firebase is open. Um, so OK, so you can't see the login form. And that's because I've gated it off. The form now only shows up if there is a user, and the user's UID is some UID. So if I go back to auth, I can see all the users that have been created, copy my own UID. Again, this is not a best practice security-wise, but I'm just trying to show you quickly what you can detect. OK, so now I can see the form. Um, and you, while you can edit it in Firebase, because the security is very bad, you cannot go to this URL here. Um, here. Let me show you the full URL of this preview. You cannot go to this URL, log in, and see this form. Um, but you actually can't go to this URL at all because uh, it's not publicly available. The Cloud9 preview URLs are not publicly available on the internet. You can make them so by following this set of directions, which I've never fully finished reading. <laughs> um, so instead, we're going to use now. So using now is simply a matter of installing the package. And then creating an account with your email. And then checking your email. All right, 
So that means I'm logged in now. So now that I've got my account, how do you create, how do I get this deployed with now? It's very complicated, a lot of steps. So you type now, and yes. And soon it will be deployed at this URL. So I got that copied into my clipboard. So meanwhile, we can talk a little bit about some of these security holes. <clears throat> so for example, the database obviously has some security holes. So if I was go to go to the database, you can set up rules. And here's where you set up the rules. And this is basically any document in the database allow anybody to read and write to it, which isn't very good. Um, some better rules you can see in this forum I made for my friends. This is allowing users to update and delete documents if they made it themselves or if they're the admin. Anyway, that's why I'd, you can see why I didn't take the Durian suggestion. I already used it previously. Um, and then another security hole is don't put your API key into your code. So instead, you can put it in your environment using your bash RC. You can just export API key equals whatever. And then in your app.js, you can get it with process end. And then there's actually one more step in your package.json. In front of your start and build scripts, you gotta put, you gotta grab those things from the environment and then put a React app prefix in front of them. And then React scripts will incorporate it and your React app can access it. So we won't do that now. Okay, deployment seems to be ready, so let's take a look. All right. So it's up. And <laughs> the only thing is, um, if you try to sign in, it won't work, because this isn't whitelisted. But instead of whitelisting it, um, let's do something else. So the way that now works is every time you do a deployment, it puts up a completely new deployment with a new URL. And all of the previous deployments are all accessible. So this is great for versioning and rolling back. And you can put some more stable alias stable URL and point it to whatever you want to be your production deployment. So, oops. Let's alias the thing we just deployed to cats gas pizza. Okay. So now if you go to cats gas pizza now.sh there you are and then I can take it and whitelist it. And you can utterly ruin that app. And then I'll probably delete it soon so you can't expire my Firebase quota. All right, so if you were to go there, you could probably sign in. <laughs> So there we go. So uh, in <laughs> so I've never downloaded anything to my computer really, and managed to get a React app with the backend and auth up and running in about 20 minutes. So pretty good workflow, I think. <laughs> I'm pretty happy with it. And uh, so there's my contact info. There is my Twitter. I don't really talk about uh, coding very much, so just a warning, talk about a lot of other things. There's my email, and there is the repo for this demo that I just made. <laughs>